we'd like to kick things off with a writer who once went on a lot of internet dates and writes about those mistakes for the websites in, your, in our words and Roll Reboot. Mm -hmm. She's been published in The Rumpus, McSweeney's Internet Tendency, and The Tampa Review. And her stories have been featured on, I'm sorry, I think I might say this wrong, Vocalo.org at 89.5 FM. Vocalo, thank you. <laughs> sorry, I apologize. <laughs> She performs around Chicago and is the founder and host of Story Club. Please welcome Dana Norris. Is that the correct height? I think it is. I think we're good. Julie Smith tells me that I shouldn't say I swear anymore. I'm sitting on the turquoise fuzzy lid of her parents' toilet, and she is sitting on the edge of the bathtub. Uh, we are eight years old, and our hands are covered in glue, and we are waiting impatiently for them to dry. My nose itches, and I'm struggling not to scratch it, because I don't want to ruin the glue. We coated our hands with glue, because once the glue is dry, we'll get to experience that exquisite pleasure of peeling off the dry glue. It's just like forcibly removing a glove, which threatens to take your skin with it, but never does. <laughs> Julie goes on and tells me, I swear means to promise the name of the devil. Instead, I should say, I solemnly affirm. <laughs> to solemnly affirm is to promise the name of God. I make a face in response. I've been saying I swear my entire life and no one has ever corrected me. I told Julie, I don't think it's so bad. And then Julie's face hardens, and she starts talking about her church, the Traders Point Christian Church, about how hell is real, and if you don't accept Jesus in your heart, you will go to hell, and no one can help you in hell, and everything hurts in hell, and you have to make a choice not to be bad to accept Jesus into your heart right now, today, but that's not good enough, because you also have to choose Jesus again tomorrow, and tomorrow, and tomorrow, every day, because being a Christian isn't easy, it is hard, it is very hard, and the Bible says that not everyone can be saved, and most people won't be, and you have to do everything as good as you can so God will love you and save you from hell. <laughs> I stare at my drying hands, and I realize I am going to hell. <laughs> it strikes through me cold down to my tailbone, and I feel ashamed. I commit another sin. I lie and say I have to go. I trip down Julie's carpeted brown stairs out onto the front lawn where my bike is resting in the grass. As I pedal home, I rip the glue off my hands. I don't even enjoy the pleasant tearing sensation because my mind has kicked over. Something inside of it has expanded. I am small and weak and destined for flame. Each Sunday morning, my parents woke me up, made me put on white tights, shiny black shoes, dresses with itchy lace collars. I was dropped off at the Sunday school portion of St. Luke's United Methodist Church. I sat at a low green card table and was instructed to glue macaroni onto paper plates so I had something to show for the hour. I was picked up by my parents what seemed like an eternity later and asked what I learned and met with a frown when I reported nothing. My parents' favorite minister, Dr. McGriff, once said in a sermon, I don't think Hitler's in hell. I think God is still working on him. <laughs> And my father quoted these words proudly, happy to belong to a faith that was not fixated on punishment. But now, thanks to Julie Smith, I was. <laughs> my mind was on fire with the question, how can I know I won't go to hell? My bedtime ritual became one of absolution. I would kiss my porcelain cat 30 times. I would kiss the picture of my parents 30 times. I would carefully place my children's learning Bible with a pink cover underneath my pillow. I would then kiss my teddy bear 30 times on the lips. And I would pray continuously the entire time. Dear God, please watch over this house and this family tonight, amen. Dear God, please watch over this house and this family tonight, amen. But each night, the actions became more and more repetitive, less and less strenuous, and I would feel my goodness recede. I tried to compensate by increasing the number from 30 to 40 to 50 to 60, but there is no place for penance in the United Methodist Church. I mean, in that faith, the a um, just asking for forgiveness ensures it will be granted. But that wasn't sufficient for me. I longed for something more strenuous, something Catholic. So I imposed it on myself. <laughs> It's now 1997. I'm an undergraduate in college in an Old Testament class, which I'm taking as a part of a general education requirement for college. I have a new heavy red Bible with more footnotes than actual text. <laughs> it is the first week of class. We've just finished Genesis, and the professor asks, so, how many creation stories did you just read? We all answer, one, because, duh. 
<laughs> but then she shows us how God made the world, including humankind in his image, in the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them, God blessed them. And then on the seventh day, he rests. But then he creates man again from dust, and this man is alone, without a woman. And then God then goes and creates woman. The woman who exists in early Genesis disappears, only to be created again, and there are two creation stories. Biblical scholars think early Genesis was modeled on a Babylonian myth, while later Genesis is a story unique to the Old Testament. The disparity between the existence of a woman and the two stories is the basis for the Jewish legend of Lilith, the first woman who refused to have sex with Adam and ran away, prompting God to create the more docile Eve. <laughs> it's true. I love Jewish myths. Um, they explain so much. It is also the basis of my 18-year-old self sitting in a classroom and feeling as though her brain is melting and running out of her ears. This was the first time I'd actually sat down and read the Bible, and I am astounded, because it is, it is messy, it is undone, it is contradictory. So what if the Bible isn't an absolute? What if the rules I had assumed were concrete aren't just flexible, but they actually don't exist? What if Julie Smith is full of shit? <laughs> I follow the professor to her office after class, and I declare a religion major. There is a theory that Martin Luther, who broke from the Catholic Church and founded Lutheranism, was less due to his own religious feelings and more because he suffered from a for form of obsessive compulsive disorder called scrupulosity. It's an overwhelming urge to avoid evil coupled with the intense fear of divine retribution. He would confess the same minuscule sins over and over again to the point that priests avoided him. He eventually had to create a faith where he stopped confessing because he could not confess enough. And my mind won't let me peacefully accept the concept of hell because it also insists on taking the idea of being watched straight to its insane limits. Either everything counts or nothing does. 1999, I'm a junior in a New Testament class and I am yelling at a freshman. <laughs> I am near tears and she stares back at me clear-eyed and assured. We've been divided into groups in class and asked to list qualities we would require a savior to have in modern times so we can compare our requirements to those presented by the Gospel of Mark. The freshman is a girl with brown curly hair and a purple puffy vest, and she speaks first. Well, I would know if Christ walked into this room because I would already be gone, called up to heaven. The logical part of my brain starts working, dismantling her argument, while the emotional side of my brain begins to uncoil, angry and wild. Why do you think you'll be called up to heaven? I ask. She smiles at me, serenely, because it says so in the Bible. I gesture to the rest of our increasingly uncomfortable group, and the rest of us will not be called up to heaven. Some of you, probably, but not all. And why exactly do you believe this? Because it says so in the Bible. Yes, yes, well, it says lots of things in the Bible. Many contradictory things are said in the Bible. It is not a book of literal fact. She twirls a pen in her hands. The Bible's divinely inspired. The Bible is a translation. What you're reading is a translation of a translation of a translation that's been put through so many lenses that words could have been lost, altered, changed to their opposite meaning. Unless you read ancient Greek, you do not actually know what it literally says. She drops the pen considers me for a moment. The translations were divinely inspired. <laughs> I am aghast, red-faced, sputtering, all of them? Yes. And the professor suddenly has her hands on me. She is pulling me out of the room into the hallway, and she holds my shoulders as I cry. It's hard, she says, but it really is not your place to talk someone out of what they believe. <laughs> I know she's right, <laughs> but that is not why I'm crying. I mean, I'm frustrated, but I'm also jealous. I've never been as sure as anything as this girl is of her religious worldview, and yes, it is a worldview that I think is crazy and loud and predicated on the everlasting damnation of millions of strangers, but it brings her comfort, <laughs> a comfort which I crave. If hell is real and I'm on the side of good fighting against evil, then maybe I can feel comfort. I can stare at logic with wide, clear eyes and say no. You are absolutely incorrect. You are incorrect because I believe you are incorrect. <laughs> the study of religion is dismantling my frantic, panicked belief in hell, but it's leaving in its wake a void, a space that is so cold and empty that I'm starting to hate people who glow with the assurance of God's love. 
believing in hell was uncomfortable for me, but at least it was a belief in something. And it feels good to believe in heaven. We want there to be a place we go after we die where our grandmother greets us with smiles. But we believe in binaries, opposites, duality, and we know that in order for heaven to be as good as we need it to be, there must also exist its exact opposite, a terrible, painful place where your grandmother removes your skin while laughing. <laughs> The two must exist together, side by side, which then leaves you with a task be on the side of good and do everything you can to avoid and thwart evil. And this thought, while creating a terrible evil that you abhor, also imbues you with agency because it implies you can do something. Your actions have far-reaching consequences that someone is not only watching, but he cares. He cares a lot. But I don't know that. I know that there is an unknown a point after which we have no reliable data. And I know that I no longer believe in hell. Thank you.